Hello, thank you for joining us. A mother from Bradford who starved her own son to death and left his body in a cot for nearly two years has been found guilty of killing him. Hamza Khan was four when he died. He was so malnourished, he was as small as a six-month-old baby. A jury took less than five hours to convict Amanda Hutton of manslaughter. Well, in a moment, we'll be live at Bradford Crown Court and in Heaton, where Hutton lived in filthy conditions with five other school-aged children. We'll also investigate several opportunities that the authorities had to intervene. First, our crime correspondent John Cundy reports on today's verdict. This is Hamza Khan, a four-year-old boy subjected to the most appalling neglect by the woman who should have cared for him most, a victim of his mother's addiction to drink and drugs. After three weeks in court, Amanda Hutton has been found guilty of killing her son by gross negligence. She left Hamza dead in his cot for nearly two years in a house that was filthy, squalid and stank. Almost every room of Hutton's house had been covered with feet-high rotting food, stinking nappies, bags of rubbish, empty pizza boxes and discarded vodka bottles. Some doors were jammed by the debris so deep the carpets couldn't be seen. One doctor described the smell as almost beyond description. Even hardened police officers were nauseated by the squalid conditions. As a police officer with 28 years service and as, as a mum myself, I found this a particularly distressing case to investigate. Hamza was four and a half when he died in December 2009. He should have been wearing clothes this size, but his growth had been so stunted that his mummified body was discovered wearing a baby grow like this, made for a six months old and still too big for him. Hamza also had on a soiled, fly-infested nappy. It was Detective Constable Richard Dove who made the awful discovery as he pulled back layers of clothing, shoes and bedding from a cot in an upstairs bedroom, he revealed the head and face of a long dead child. He told the court, my hand was shaking. I asked myself, is that real what I've seen? One expert said there'd been so little left of Hamza's body, it had been almost impossible to pinpoint the cause of his death. It's probably the most difficult case I've ever had to put together. The cause of death was the biggest single problem and even now nobody can be 100% sure, although all the evidence pointed very strongly to gross malnutrition causing Hamza's death. When first arrested, Amanda Hutton appeared unsteady on her feet as she was taken to Keithley Police Station. Good evening, where's Amanda here then? Yes. Okay. Um, we've been asked to attend by social services to, for a uh, referral order in relation to this lady. Yes, I'm not going to get you a chair, love, all right? Hutton was initially held on suspicion of murder, but she was to claim throughout her trial that Hamza had died from natural causes and she'd been too frightened to ever report his death. Hamza's father, Aftab Khan, had had a volatile 20-year relationship with Hutton, but they'd split up after he'd admitted assaulting her some time before Hamza's death. Hutton's second eldest son, Keza, here on the left, said his mother, who admitted being an alcoholic and a drug user, had spent most of her days drinking vodka and cider in her bedroom. Hutton claimed it was only after Hamza died that she'd gone to pieces. Prosecutors disagreed. Before Hutton's trial, her elder son, Tariq, had admitted helping prevent the lawful burial of his brother over nearly two years. He's due to be sentenced at the same time as his mother for his part in a crime which some detectives have called one of the most harrowing and appalling cases they've ever dealt with. It's a question that we will keep asking. Could this have been prevented? We know Amanda Hutton had been a victim of domestic violence and as a result the family was known to police, to social services and to health workers. We also learned during the trial that Hamza Khan never saw a GP, missed appointments for vaccinations and was only seen once by a health visitor. Our health correspondent Jamie Coulson has been investigating how this could happen. When police discovered the remains of Hamza Khan, it was a sight that disturbed even hardened officers. A four-year-old child mummified in his cot, having effectively starved to death. So how could this happen? And what opportunities, if any, were missed that could have prevented Hamza's death? 
The trial was focused on Amanda Hutton and her role in Hamza's death, but this was a family that had appeared on the radar of police, social services and health professionals, so could more have been done? Hamza was born in June 2005 and in July he was seen by a health visitor for the first and only time. In 2006, after repeated attempts to see Hamza, health visitors contacted social services. In November, a social worker saw the family but was satisfied with what she found. In 2007, Hamza missed numerous appointments for immunisation, leaving him at risk of disease. He'd never seen a GP and his mother was eventually suspended by her GP for missing appointments. In 2008, Hamza's father was arrested for assaulting Amanda Hutton and during an interview he warned police to check on Hamza. In 2009, a policewoman visited the home and saw Hamza but wasn't concerned with what she saw. By this stage, medical experts say Hamza would have been malnourished. And on the 15th of December, Hamza Khan died, effectively having starved to death. The agencies that came into contact with Amanda Hutton and Hamza will now face questions over the role they played. Health visitors were repeatedly refused access to Hamza, but did refer the matter to social services. In cases where families are purposefully denying access, uh, trying to hide things, and that can be hugely complicated. And it requires real skilled professionals with lots of time and resource to be able to get that access and support and, and provide that support ultimately to keep that child safe. Hamza wasn't registered with a GP until he was 15 months old and never saw a doctor. Unfortunately, this particular case where a child is not registered with a GP at all uh, wouldn't cause any alarm bells ringing at all within a general practice. I think we need to look and see whether there are ways uh, that those who were in contact with the child uh, could have known that the child was not registered sort of at an early age um, and maybe taken steps to try and address that. The police dealt with incidents of domestic violence and an officer saw Hamza eight months before he died. When we dealt with the incidents of domestic violence, no, we didn't have concerns about the, the, the care of the children, but we did make the referrals through to social services. Um, she had a number of children and we wanted to ensure that she had the, the support that she needed. Social services had contact with the family, but Bradford Council won't comment in detail before the outcome of a separate investigation. However, this is a report from 2009, the same year that Hamza died, into social services here in Bradford. It was commissioned in the wake of the Baby P scandal, and while it does highlight many positive aspects about safeguarding here in the city, it also highlights concerns in neglect cases where they could drift without any agency taking ownership or working out a clear plan. Bradford Council say Amanda Hutton's refusal of help and the fact no serious concerns were raised by other sources meant they had limited involvement in the case. A serious case review will now determine whether more could have been done for Hamza Khan. Jamie Coulson, BBC Look North. Well, we're joined now by Bernard Gallagher, who's a child protection expert at the University of Huddersfield, and by MP David Ward, who's in Bradford. Uh, Bernard, I'll start with you. Many of our viewers tonight will be absolutely bewildered as to how a child can starve to death in 21st century Britain. Why did the safeguards not work? Well, I can quite understand people's emotional reaction to the case, but without uh, wishing to be glib, I think in some ways the case appears to be quite simple. You had a parent here who was extremely cruel, but also a parent like any other parent who enjoys a right of privacy. So basically she was doing things to Hamza behind closed doors that no one knew of. And there were problems in the family, clearly of domestic violence, alcohol abuse, but there was no particular indication of Hamza being neglected and certainly no indication that he was being neglected to that extreme degree. We're hearing more and more cases of children dying through neglect. Do, do you think that, that you know, he, he wasn't coming up on the radar, they missed doctor's appointments? Surely alarm bells should have been ringing. Well, not necessarily, because uh, apart from the legal duty to register a child's uh, uh, birth, uh, there are no other particular uh, duties upon parents to have contact with agencies until the child is of school age. So although uh, he missed in, uh, uh, inoculations, you know, many parents, well, at least some parents, have chosen not to have their, pet, their child inoculated for various reasons. Uh, so there were no particular warning signs just because uh, the parent didn't want contact with agencies. OK, let's talk to uh, David Ward now. Um, David, Amanda Hutton repeatedly missed GP appointments. 
Health visitors were turned away. She was hostile to them. And Hamza's birth wasn't registered until 15 months after he'd been born. Nobody, it seems, was joining the dots up here, were they? Well, I agree. <clears throat> it is actually quite simple. This child should still be alive. And this child has been badly, sadly, let down by, by the system. Um, we've all followed this appalling case with a, a mixture of shock and and horror but most of all disbelief in terms of how could this be allowed to happen there will be a, a case review uh, and we need to ensure this thing that never ever it won't be of any value of course this poor poor child um, but this thing should never have happened and must never ever happen again clearly if a parent refuses to engage with the authorities what can be done what more can we learn from this awful terrible tragedy that's not good enough uh, it's not good enough to say that. Um, the state has a duty, a responsibility and a duty to protect children from atrocious parents. Uh, and we need to provide support to parents, but at the end of the day, it's the child that we need to protect. And sometimes in families, things go wrong, and it is then that the state is needed. One organ of the state, one part of it, needs to do the work that is necessary to protect the child and sadly, this has not happened in this case, and we need to ensure it never, ever happens again. Bernard, Mr Ward touched there on that serious case review. H how important is that now? Well, that case review will be very important because it will be a much more objective, systematic attempt to actually investigate what did happen in the case and, indeed, whether mistakes were made and anything could be learned. But I think it is really important that we don't start jumping to conclusions and simply assume, as tends to be the knee-jerk reaction, that agencies made mistakes. There was agency inter intervention in these cases, and to some degree, you know, some of that intervention seemed to work well. Because we've touched on it, but apart from registering the birth of your child, there is no obligation on parents to have any interaction with authorities, is there? Exactly, and as I've said before, really, there were no particular warning signs, certainly not that Hamza would be subject to such severe neglect. David Ward, briefly, um, where do we go from here? Well, if people are saying that uh, the system is at fault and the system needs to be changed, we cannot have a situation where the professionals, the people who are there uh, to protect children, are not allowed to do their job of protecting children. And yes, there will be an issue of, of privacy, but for God's sake, how on earth can the system allow this to happen? And if there are changes that are needed, then those changes must be made. OK, David Ward, many thanks for joining us this evening. And Bernard Gallagher, thank you for coming in tonight. You're welcome.